Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay here, and today I'm here with Ian uh, from Axiom Audio, the founder and the great man behind the company. Uh, we're here at a beautiful lake, so that's that. <laughs> that's a change of scenery from my usual claustrophobic studio, so that's good to see. Um, so, Axiom Audio, we did a recent tour video, and in that video, uh, I found that you guys put yourself to very high standards than you know many of the brands out there. For example, you guys do a lot of torture tests. Um, yes. You guys go through the trouble of bringing a speaker. How many foot up? Oh, the hundred foot tower. Yes, yes the hundred so foot can... tower, um, and a quick chamber measurements and all that. How did you? How I'm sure you didn't have all that from the very beginning. So how did it start and how did you get to where you are today? It's, uh, it was an interesting beginning, this was about 40 years ago and I, I really started probably the way a lot of uh, people did in the, in the speaker business is that I, I got into it as a kid and I was building speakers and um, thought I was pretty good at it. Uh, people seemed to want to buy them. So from that, the company began, and I was very, very fortunate in, in really the first year that, that I began Axiom to uh, end up going to the National Research Council in Ottawa, where, where I met Floyd Toole. And um, I had my, one of my speakers with me, and you know, was thinking it was going to be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> And I found out pretty quickly that there was a lot more to this science than I had any any clue about um, at all. I, I mean, at that point in time, the general thinking was is that um, speakers were like, you know, the hearing was like your taste buds, for example. And like some you people would East Coast sound. Yeah, East Coast, East Coast sound, sound yeah. the West Coast sound, a rock and roll speaker. Yeah jazz speaker, the British sound. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you, were, you were sort of putting yourself in one of these boxes and, you know, that was your sound. And, um, and of course, all this got turned on its head when, when we started to do a double blind listen tests. Um, now we were starting to get scientific results on that. And, I mean, the results could have gone either way. It's just the way they went is that people actually heard the same way. So it was a lot more like, say, eyesight than taste bud. Um, so you had clear winners in these listen tests and clear losers. It didn't matter what the uh, participants uh, bent on music style was or anything like that. Um, they, they tended to agree. The percentage was very high. It was over 80%. Um, and uh, and my original speaker didn't do very well in this test, <laughs> <laughs> so I realized I better I better get my butt into that laboratory right mm -hmm. away. And and you could rent the laboratory, so that was that was fantastic. I became a regular there, and um, and have been really involved in the science of loudspeaker design ever since. Um, uh, Floyd. Floyd eventually left in uh, 92 uh, to go down and become uh, a vice president of, um, of engineering for Harman. And um, so a few years after that, I guess uh, you could still rent the laboratory at the NRC, but the, the whole camaraderie around it had sort of disappeared. And, you know, the old days of going there and hanging out with the other speaker designers and Floyd Toole and the... I guess the fun was gone. So anyway, we, and, and plus I was getting sick of the drive. <laughs> <laughs> so we did end up building a laboratory at Axiom in Dwight, which um, really replicated in many ways. The chamber is identical to the one at NRC. I literally took the nameplate off the NRC chamber and called them and said, I want one of these. Um, so it's, in a lot of ways, a lot of similarities. I guess where some differences are is we went into much deeper testing. So you saw the torture yeah. chamber. Yeah. Um, the idea being that um, 
you know, what you get out of measurements from an anechoic chamber, I guess, would be accuracy. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily all there is to this game. I mean, there's the question of dynamics. Mm -hmm. Some people want to be able to turn it up. Yep. They want accuracy and they want dynamics and they want to be able to play it loud. Well, you know, accuracy alone isn't going to get you there. So over the years in our torture chamber, we've done, uh, well, we've blown up a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember you taking me there and the first thing you said to me is, this is where we actually try to break stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I found that quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yes. <laughs> And over the years, you just slowly sort of um, get better and better at that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you take something in there and, you know, we have that 1500 watt mono amplifier yes. in there mm -hmm. and, and plus the big Bryson one. I don't know if you saw that on the rack, yeah. but... Um, big, big toroidal transformer. Yeah, yeah. A real lot of power, a lot of dynamic headroom, right? And and we really we really try and break stuff and, and you just slowly sort of uh, bit by bit fix what breaks and then you find the next thing and you push that envelope a little further a little further a little further and there's 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 sort of two sides to this e there's three sides to this equation i would say one you don't want it to break mm -hmm. but also you don't want it to make extraneous noises so when it does hit the limits you don't want it to sort of bottom out or uh you know kind of fart at you a little bit or something that really real ruins the experience mm -hmm. Uh, so you need it to kind of just um, stop playing any louder. Mm. That that works. But then you also need that threshold to be as high as possible, otherwise it becomes a limit on dynamics. So yeah, inter interesting game. Um, Very interesting. Now, going into some of the speaker designs that you have on hand um, that we saw on the video today, and also I have one in for review. Yeah. Um, which is coming soon, by the way. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you just got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been nuts. But um, I, I want to touch upon the, ba um, the reason you have two tweeters. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain about that a little bit? It's, it's just for dynamics. For dynamics. Yeah. You can, you can simply get, um, you know, when you're going after a combination of accuracy and dynamics, at some point, you're either going to have to go to a horn, or you're going to have to use multiple drivers. So and whether that be the mid-range, the tweeter, doesn't matter. So a question a person may ask is, why two? Why not three or four or five? Well, if you get into the, you know, like the uh, LFR 1100 omnidirectional speaker, it in fact does have four. Right. Yeah, and and uh, the only reason for not going even beyond that is is that um, you'd probably be hard pressed to find an amplifier that would that would be able to um, cause that to go into any kind of compression hmm. it, I mean we've done a lot of work on that tweeter to get it to the point where it doesn't it doesn't blow up it doesn't compress early um, and then you put two of those things together and I'm not sure where you're going to find the amplifier that's going to cause that a problem, and that's the only reason. I mean, if it took three, we'd put three in. If it took five, we could put five in. Uh, and the omnidirectionals do have four, so we have kind of gone down that road anyway. Right? Mm. Now, the other interesting that thing I found was that you've gone with some of your models um, to the active route. Yes. And so. What's your vision in that? Um, do you think that the active speakers are the future, or do you think that you have better control uh, with active speakers in terms of as, as a designer's perspective? Uh, because I know for a fact that you know some some speaker designers uh, likes to make their speakers active, yeah, because they have full control over what the end user will hear. Mm -hmm. Because they're sick and tired of hearing, oh man, that speaker sounds bad when they have it hooked up to a twenty-dollar amplifier. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was was uh, what was your reason? Well, I'm a huge fan of of fully active. Mm -hmm. As a speaker designer, you have way more control over what you can do, and it's not that we don't have decent control analog. I mean, the fact is, we can get pretty damn close uh, analog to what we can do digitally, but. 
No, digital is, uh, you know, having a digital signal processor on an active system is the ultimate way to design a speaker. And I think that, I think that it is the future. So it's not really about active versus passive. It's about active with a digital signal processor. And then actually, of course, having the equipment to know what to do with that and the ability to measure it. So none of that does you any good if you don't have an anechoic chamber, for example. How are you going to know where you're at? Um, but yeah, I, I think that the, the important caveat is not necessarily just active versus passive, but active digital signal processing. Yes, it, it's the right way to do it. Okay. Um, now, I remember when I first uh, stepped into the room, uh, you've mentioned that it's a repetition between measurements, listening test, blind AB, and a combination of all those three things. Yes. Um, let's say that, you know, of course, measurements and you know, blind AB tests have gone uh, very far ahead, but mm -hmm. you've also mentioned how blind AB tests, you um, look very carefully at the comments. Yes. The comment section on your blind A-B test because you frequently find the same criticism or same positive thing that people write down that um, you can incorporate into your loudspeakers. Right. Yeah, the score itself is, it's not enough information. Mm -hmm. You might know which one won or lost in a particular area of the sound. We sort of just divide it into you know, bass, mid, and treble. But... Um, that doesn't really tell you a lot. You need to know why. Mm -hmm. Why Why did this lose in that area? And, uh, and that leads you to the research, I guess, of yeah. correlating uh, measurements with what we hear mm -hmm. and what people actually prefer. Yes. Yes. The, the, the double-blind listen test is absolutely critical, and it tells you whether you're, uh, you've read your measurements correctly, I guess. Um, ultimately, you have to win that test, otherwise the speaker is not going to mark it. If it doesn't win the double blind listen test, then it's not, it's not going anywhere, it's a, it's a dead duck. Or it goes back and gets redesigned, maybe completely. The, um, the measurements are, are I, I guess what, what's so cool about this is that we, we can kind of predict what the double blind listen test is going to be by the measurements. And, mm -hmm. and there's certainly been a lot of research done on this by, by Floyd tool, uh, post NRC. Um, and they, 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 they absolutely come to the same conclusion that you can predict the listening test, uh, from the measurements. So, I guess what happens is when you get down to the sort of the finite detail, that gets a little bit tougher. If, if, if you look at something and it just simply measures badly, like there's no point in taking it to the double blind test. I mean, you can, but you, mm -hmm. we already know the result. But when you get into things that are all very, very good and all measure very, very well, and especially since, since what we hear is very much influenced by the, um, the, the low Q of the amplitude response, not the high Q. So visually, you tend to look at the high Q. Mm -hmm. um, really slaps you in the face, and it's really hard to see the low Q. But the low Q is what matters in, in the listen test. So, you know, there's, a, there's always a little sort of playing around at the end to, to try, and, try and get a little bit higher result in the score. Okay. Um... So the last hard question that I want to ask you before we, I, I let you go is um, when it comes to loudspeaker designs, is there a perfectly, like a perfect measuring loudspeaker or is it a compromise of uh, getting it best as possible? <laughs> <laughs> I asked this question because you mentioned the, you know, the... the, the yes, yes, yes. Before. <laughs> well, here's, here, here's the short answer. Sure. Uh, um, you know, loudspeaker design is inevitably always some form of a uh, compromise. Mm -hmm. There was a wonderful sign, I think it hung above Floyd Tool's desk, and it said, uh, you know, E equals MC squared 
plus or minus three dB. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so even though if you take something like the LFR 1100 Active, where the listening window and the sound power are sitting directly on top of each other, and I, I mean, this is this gets mind-blowing results in the, in the double blind listen test. It, 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 it's, it's hard to get a fraction of a better result, but this thing really does, does go in the extra mile. I mean, it's incredible. But even then, if you take this, if you looked at those measurements, I mean, they're literally perfect. But they also are made up of, you know, hundreds of other measurements. And those individual measurements are not all perfect. Ah, plus or minus 3 dB. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think there is, uh, there's, I think there's a lot of places to go. Uh, um, I mean, I, I've become addicted to it. Um, doing these omnidirectional speakers. I think it's a lot to do with the future. And I, I think there's a long way to go. So yeah, um, no, we're not past the compromise yet. Well, then we're just getting there better. Will, there will be no fun in it, right? <laughs> the continued research. Yes, yes. Well, I better hurry up. I got to retire soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for me. Um, Thank you so much for answering all the questions with honesty and uh, we'll see you on the next one.